This spring's Curating the Campus series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries, the Museum of Natural History, and Research Computing. Our collaboration stems from a common interest in shared understanding of the informatic needs and digital infrastructures necessary for cultural heritage institutions to continue to reach the world through our unique collections. The third and final talk of this series will be with Nicole Coleman from Stanford on artificial intelligence, the library and digital research practices. And that will be on April 28th. Um, before I introduce Mark, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. So please, um, make sure that your microphone is on mute for this session. We are recording and live closed captioning is available if you need it. If you have questions at any point, please put them in the chat and Mark will address them at the end of the talk. So today's speaker is Dr. Mark Phillips, Associate Dean for Digital Libraries at the University of North Texas. His area of research interest include workflows for digitized and board digital content, digital preservation systems, web archives, and metadata quality. Today, we are pleased to have Mark speak on leveraging digital library infrastructure for enabling access to unique collections. Again, we will be taking questions via the chat function after the presentation, but you can feel free to put those questions in the chat at any time throughout the session. So without further ado, I will turn the stage over to Mark Phillips. Welcome, Mark. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to confirm that everyone can see my uh, uh, leveraging my title slide and that you can hear me. All right. Um, well, thank you all for um, inviting me to have the this talk today. Um, I hope that it's interesting or um, uh, at least uh, a, the tiniest bit thought provoking in certain areas. Um, this is me, since you don't get to see me in person. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for Digital Libraries, as was said. These are different ways to contact me or keep in touch with me if you're interested. Always, um, I always welcome that. Um, and these will be up at the end of the talk as well. Um, just a, a little bit for those that don't know where um, University of North Texas is located. We're located in Denton, Texas, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, we have a student enrollment of just, a, just over 40,000 students, um, 32,000 undergrads, almost 8,000 graduate students. We are one of we are a university in the University of North Texas system, which is one of six university systems in Texas. So um, uh, Texas is is unique in how we do some things, and we're you know one of the many un university systems. Um, so we're not part of the UT system. We're not part of the Texas A and M system. We're a system to our ourselves. Um, the UNT libraries where I call home is um, we have six different uh, locations. Two of those are uh, remote storage facilities. And then we have four uh, branch locations on our campuses. Um, we have um, roughly 60 uh, librarians, 92 staff, and we are the second largest student employer on campus, which is always exciting. Um, we have a like a standard collection metric of around 3.9 million items. and um, uh, you can reach our library website at the link there if you're interested. And so a little bit about my background. Um, so I've, I've been working at the UNT library since I started as a librarian in 2004. Um, I got my master's at UNT um, in information science, library science, and started there um, right after that. Um, and I've been involved in digital libraries from the very beginning. And I, I uh, was lucky enough to kind of get in at the very early stages of some of the development on um, digital libraries and um, have been working in that space um, the whole time. Um, I got into libraries because I was really interested in combining my kind of interest in computers uh, and technology with uh, organizing things, making things available and um, uh, sharing those with others. Um, and as was discussed earlier, some of my research interests, I, I'm really interested in web archiving, digital preservation. And then over the past few years, I've really gotten interested in understanding um, the metadata that we're creating for our digital cultural heritage collections. So the, the biggest um, component of my day job is, is working with um, all of the infrastructure and the, the projects around what is called the portal to, to Texas history. 
Um, this is a, is a, a platform that we've been building for um, over 15 years now to host uh, collections, um, cultural heritage collections for uh, institutions around the state of Texas. Currently, we're hosting over 430 almost 440 different partner institutions around Texas and hosting over 1.6 million items um, freely available to anyone to access. Um, we also have the UNT Digital Library, which fits into kind of the portfolio that I work with, which is um, uh, all of the, uh, the university output and things that don't directly fall within the Texas history scope. Um, very similar kind of inter interface. We're uh, just shy of 900,000 items um, from 33 partners across the UNT campus um, and uh, hosting collections there. We also work with uh, the Oklahoma Historical Society to operate the Gateway to Oklahoma History, which um, is a collection of uh, primarily newspapers and photographs from their deep collections up in um, Oklahoma City. And uh, we've been working with them for um, about eight years on hosting, hosting their collections um, within our infrastructure. Um, in total, these, these three kind of platforms build the UNT Libraries digital collections. And so we're, we're hosting um, and curating and managing um, just over 3 million uh, unique digital objects. And so we have just over 3 million metadata records describing items. And so it's um, starting to become a, a, a very large um, operation to, to manage and deal with. But getting back to the, the kind of the title for my talk, um, uh, leveraging digital library infrastructure and, and for enabling access to unique collections. And I'd like to take the, the unique, uh, unique um, opportunity as speaker to amend my title. And so I would like to, uh, to insert digital in there uh, one more time um, and to talk more specifically about unique digital collections as opposed to just unique collections. Um, so the, the focus I, it, on the first part of this will be uh, more so on uh, the unique digital collections that we're providing access to as opposed to um, other kinds of collections. And so when we start to think about what are our kind of unique digital collections, and um, I, I think the, the digital in there is important at this point in time. Um, in the future, it might not be um, because it, it, it differentiates in our mind some of the uh, the notions of, of legacy collections versus current and new and future collections that we do. Um, oftentimes when we talk about um, uh, leveraging digital collections, and especially when we talk about um, unique digital collections, um, most of the times folks are talking about uh, digitized versions of an unique analog collections they have. And um, those are amazing, those are important, those have, um, there's nothing wrong with those, but I, I think that there's also a, a component that, that should be talked about more um, in large research libraries about what we're doing in the scope of collecting born digital content and what that looks like for a research institution so that when we're um, 50 years in the future from now, we are looking back at things we collected um, in the digital formats, um, as opposed to uh, looking back and saying, boy, we should have, we should have collected some stuff then. So um, what does it mean to build um, unique digital collections? And so that's, that's kind of what, what I'm gonna talk about. Some of, the, some of the different examples that we've um, kind of worked on here at UNT, just to kind of get um, some of the uh, ideas flowing. Um, so naturally, most of us, most of our institutions have uh, been curating the output our, of our university for, for a long while. Um, most institutions have some sort of institutional repository for managing the uh, published research output of the university. Ours is called UNT Scholarly Works. It's a collection within the UNT Digital Library. Um, most of our institutions have moved completely to uh, online the or to electronic theses and dissertations. Um, we, we have done that as well. We started in 99 and we've also done a retrospective digitization, but we host all of the newly published theses and dissertations in the library and manage those. Another born digital collection. Many of our institutions are also managing research data in a variety of formats. Uh, we have the UNT Data Repository, which is a collection within our digital library um, and, and serves to host things like uh, Twitter data sets from Hurricane Florence or, or other, other kinds of research output that um, would be uh, interesting for preserving and, and making available to users, especially out, out of the output of grants. 
Um, we're also working with our grants and contracts administration to um, more um, to document in a more uh, a systematic way the funded um, research projects that are coming from the federal government and to make sure that we are meeting the requirements for those grants and the data management plans. Um, and that's something that's actually just started this year that we're working with. Um, so we're, we're taking data management plans, archiving those in the digital library. And then as we go through one year, two year, three year after that, we're going through and um, uh, uh, creating uh, data bibliographies for, for those items. Um, we're also working with uh, uh, trying to collect university memory around events, especially this last year. This has really come into play um, where we're trying to engage with the student population, the um, alumni uh, and, and community members to help document Denton is, or help document the university in the ways that they see it and the, and, and the methods that they're used to. And so we do this with an, an app, which we call the Keeper app, which is an open source project that we also share. Um, and it's, it's just the mechanism for allowing people to contribute content, digital content to the university. And then that gets um, accessioned through our special collections and added to our university the archives um, as a as a specific collection in the UNT Digital Library. But that's a, another example of kind of born digital collections that we're working with. Um, many digital libraries, we also are working with supporting uh, the research output of, of uh, different research projects and of faculty around the campus. So, so one example is this um, uh, collaboration that we have with the Department of Linguistics and our College of Information, um, which is the Computational Resource on South Asian Languages, CORSAL, where we're working to provide infrastructure so that um, the different languages that they're going through and documenting um, as uh, and working to preserve because they're classified as endangered languages can be um, preserved in a infrastructure that allows them to have metadata, um, to playback audio and video, to uh, link and connect to very complicated uh, digital objects with others um, and make those available. So different research projects, uh, Bershawski language from um, uh, Pakistan, um, the Lam Kong language resource, which is from the uh, the Manipur state in India, in Northeast India, um, are just two examples. Um, we're also working with uh, kind of the output of various research grants where they have uh, a lot of, we're seeing a lot of a, a pattern where, you know, they'll have um, uh, events where that they get recorded that then have a white paper and then have some other documents. And so we're providing, you know, it's easy for us to create a collection, host their content, they've already got um, a metadata profile. They know how to put. We know how to put things online, and it's really easy for them to have this output, uh, so that everyone's not creating, you know, whole unique websites and whole digital collections that then fail after three years after the grant's done, and nobody wants to support them anymore. And then we also work with just ver data sets, and this is this is one of my absolute favorite collections. This is a, a research data set from one of our. Um, uh, faculty that was from a, a USDA grant and they were documenting food waste in middle schools. And so they have um, all of these uh, before and then they have a, a set, the other picture to these would be after. So they, they labeled all the trays, they photographed them going out into the lunchroom and then they come back and you see kind of you know, you can you can pick out all the kids in middle school and you remember. Um, so it's a, just a really fascinating collection, but it's a just the raw photographic research data set that then um, would then get distilled into spreadsheets and, and data sets going forward. Um, we're also working with and, and thinking about kind of collecting and, and locally hosting other born digital content. Um, one that's a, a very long-standing grant, or not grant, a long-standing project that started in the 1990s was is the Cyber Cemetery that we're still still updating. Um, this is to archive uh, defunct federal uh, governmental websites um, once they cease to operate, um, whether or not those are agencies or commissions. Uh, once the commission has uh, uh, published its final report, um, they often don't have any sort of funding to maintain their website after it. And in some situations, the website goes down the day after the report gets released. <laughs> and so um, the goal is to try to archive those specific um, websites right at the last moment so that there can be a, a long-term record for that content. And so you have, you know, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking um, released its final report, and then we were able to capture that 
and then we can make that website available through um, our the the open wayback instance that we have here at UNT and then there's metadata records to connect users to that collection. We're also trying to experiment with what does it mean to really build um, unique digital collections. And so this is one that's um, uh, about a decade old now that we look back on as an exemplar example for us. Um, so we were kind of interested to try to figure out what it would look like to start building um, a collection around environmental policy. And so we went through and we um, downloaded, identified, downloaded, created metadata for just shy of 900 items. And since those have been online, they've had over um, half a million item uses. And so it's it's a it's a collection that um, that that we built, we put it out there, and it continues to, to get used. Um, we have uh, governmental publications from not only the US, but from other countries, especially around these large um, uh, environmental summits. Um, the, each nation that gets involved usually has um, a whole suite of documents that get published around that and trying to pull all of that together. Um, and then a number of NGOs that are publishing um, environmental policy related items. And then a couple of instances on this one, we've had uh, those NGOs a couple of years after contact us and they didn't save a copy of their report. Um, and they were wondering if they could, if, if the copy that we had was actually the copy from their website. And it's like, yes, it, yes, it was. So um, the, the assumption that somebody else is taking care of this is, is, is really strong, but also very false in a lot of situations. And so we um, collect those, provide metadata for them and uh, make them available online. Um, something in that same vein, one of the things we've been doing with uh, partners at the Library of Congress and the Internet Archive is um, in 2008, 12, 16, and now 20, we've been doing the end of term uh, federal web crawls. And so we've been trying to um, take a snapshot of the federal government's web um, and in years of transition between um, executive branch um, uh, within the executive branch, we've been trying to, to document that change that has occurred. In 2016, we, we noticed that, um, and, and so as part of that mechanism, we have a, a nomination process where, where people can come in and say, I really want you to capture this website, this web page, this, uh, this domain, or just this PDF is really important to my research, or this is a really important PDF. And we were seeing that a, a lot of PDFs were being uniquely identified. And so instead of just harvesting those and then just kind of putting them into a web archive and hoping somebody finds them. Um, currently, web archives are still really hard to use historically, like going back in time. And so um, what we decided to do was extract all of those PDFs and um, create metadata records for those uniquely and uh, to, to put those into the system. So we, we downloaded the 1900 um, uh, PDFs. We worked with partners. Um, we invited folks in to, to help create metadata for these and then um, uh, you know, tried to crowdsource the metadata. And we found that people don't like to crowdsource like complicated government document metadata. It's just not that there are people that love that, but they are few and far between. Um, but we uh, put those online and, and those have had uh, fairly good usage uh, over time and is something that we're, we're actively looking at for the 2020 um, crawls that we just finished up. This led us to kind of start thinking about how do we start working with um, the, uh, the output of these web archiving projects that we've got tons and terabytes and terabytes of data. And it's uh, unless you know it exists, it's really hard to go through and find it. And I think the, the super obvious kind of dull mo duh moment for me on this was um, we were very uh, happy we were talking that we had the 9-11 Commission's website is, is redirects to us. We had this, the, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission um, is, is located with us. We have a, a partnership with the, um, the National Archives, yada, yada, yada. And then I got asked the very simple question of, can I, I, I couldn't find the actual report in your digital library. I could find the website, but I couldn't get a link to the report. And it was like, oh my gosh, that's like, the whole purpose for these websites to exist is to create these reports. And we're not explicitly pulling out the reports and, and, and archiving those or describing those. And so that's something we're, we're then trying to do 
is go through and um, provide kind of a uh, first first level um, metadata record for all of the reports within the system. Um, some of them are are very popular titles that the government publishing office um, has released as books, but a lot of them aren't. And so they they don't have the standard library infrastructure around description, OCLC records, mark records at the Library of Congress, um, records at the at the um, uh, the government publishing office. And so um, this helps kind of put them out there in kind of the bibliographic space in a way. Um, so we are also then able to relate these reports to the um, specific websites. So this report is part of this website where we captured that and then users are able to get to that website if they're interested. Um, we were really interested in trying to explore this a bit more from a computational standpoint. And so we, we worked with um, some of our uh, at the time, they were, there was a, a professor in the computer science department at UNT who has since moved on to uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. And so we wrote a grant um, for, to IMLS to, for a research grant to explore how do we extract these content-rich PDF documents from various web archives and, and try to do it in an automated way because there's just millions and millions of things that could, could be useful within these archives, but how do we actually get to the stuff that's the most useful for us to describe? And so we worked with, um, had a kind of a two-part process where we were working with the machine learning track. There was a bunch of really cool machine learning stuff, but then there was also this qualitative track with um, publication selectors to understand what it is that they're actually doing when they're saying like, we should put this in our collection and trying to, trying to get at that around um, three different uh, data sets. We had the institutional repository use case where um, most institutions are documenting some, if not all, of their their university websites. That's a rich uh, that's a rich possible use for this kind of thing, where we could extract the publications that the faculty aren't sending to us and get those added to our collection. So many universities would benefit from this. Um, we had the state state government documents use case where we were looking at the state of Texas and the Texas.gov web archives to try to extract publications that would historically have come to depository libraries in the state of Texas. And this is one that would then scale to all 50 states in theory, because most of the states are involved in some activities around web archiving. And then finally, we have a longstanding work with the uh, Technical Report Archive and Image Library and looking at technical reports and, and working with the historic. And so kind of moving that into the, the modern day and working with the USDA um, dot gov website we created data sets information about how data sets were created um, machine learning stuff and I, I imagine these slides will be available at the ends if you're really curious um, and it was a great project it ended i'm really glad it's over just because like grants are huge amounts of work especially those final reports um, but it was really really interesting and really useful to, to kind of frame some of these questions and really understand what it, what it means to build collections out of web archives and build kind of these document collections out of web archives and there is real interest in that space and it is just right for libraries to go through and um, to like make what we do really well um, available to web archives and, and selection, identification, selection, and uh, description. And then this kind of just fits in there because I, I'm currently involved with it and I really like talking about it. So the Technical Report Archive and Image Library is a, is a, is a national uh, partnership among libraries um, interested in preserving the technical literature of the federal government. Um, we host at UNT, a portion of that. The rest is hosted at um, in Hathi Trust. We uh, host all of the the funky stuff, um, all of the things that couldn't have gone or at, that didn't go through the Google digitization process or workflow. Things with foldouts, things with maps, things with microfiche, things with just crazy, crazy formats came to us, um, uh, and so we've got just shy of um, uh, 30, 29,000 uh, reports in our system, they look like this, um, which is great. Um, and a, a lot of it's really paper-based, but one of the things that that group has started to work out, this is this kind of falls into this weird, like unique things that libraries have. So um, in the 1950s, there were um, a number of reports that were published by uh, agencies such as the, um, uh, or the Atomic Energy Commission. So it's a commission from the Department of Energy that were publishing in the, um, these reports about, you know, the um, 
the crazy stuff that was happening throughout all of that, the, the big machine that was the Atomic Energy Commission. And um, the, the, the hard part about this is these were all um, published as part of, uh, in, in microcard format, as opposed to microfiche. And so currently I'm in the process of working with a vendor to digitize this palette of, of microcards, which is 50,000 microcards. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, microcards are these um, opaque, um, basically cardstock pieces of paper that have images printed on them. And then um, trying to digitize all of these um, and actually extract the data. Um, these have challenges because they're not um, microfiche, which is a transmissive. So you can shine light through it. You have to bounce light off of, of an opaque uh, um, microcard. And it's just like, it's just really challenging to work with. But anyway, so that's that's one of the things we're we're currently working on to digitize um, uh, around thirty nine thousand reports that um, really are just locked up in in these microcard cabinets because no one has access to them. Um, very few of our institutions have microcard readers, um, and even if they do, like they're just really hard. They're not super well. Um, cataloged, um, and even if they are, like getting to them is really hard because they weren't heavily distributed. And if they were, like many many institutions have gotten rid of them. So just trying to find these unique materials and and pull them together. Um, just a couple more shots. They're 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 lovely. They white on white was really just a pain to to work with in kind of automatic imaging image processing kind of work. Like finding boundaries of box of of pages is super hard. Um, and the configurations changed quite a bit um, over the years, and they have a bunch of skew to them, and it's all it's all sort of crazy. Um, but I think it's I think there's some really interesting things that libraries can be doing in the space of collecting born digital content and using our infrastructure that we have for other reasons. Uh, maybe it's institutional repositories to build collections locally. Um, one of the projects that I've always thought was really, really interesting was um, out of Stanford and it's like 10 years now, it was the Eames project, the everyday electronic material project. And so one of the things that still is surprisingly hard is if you find like, if you find a, um, a, a, a Creative Commons licensed PDF that's really important to your collection on the web and like kind of going through that process of like, what does it mean for our library to acquire that? Um, we can point at it, we can create a catalog record and we can point to it and that's super easy. And most of our acquisition of content is really just us putting a catalog record and pointing to it and hoping that somebody else maintains it for us. And there's a massive amount of stuff that we um, as libraries rely on other people to maintain for us, which is just the way our libraries work with vendors, with um, others. But I do think that there's a, a, a slice of content that is just currently just being forgotten about. Um, and honestly, I, my, um, kind of cynical view is it's just waiting for a vendor to decide that there's money enough in it to then sell it to us and then we'd buy it like crazy because that's what libraries do um, where it's especially once we get into state state publications uh, local government publications things that are very unique to our locality um, it's just a matter of time before that's made into a product and then we'll finally collect it because we can have somebody else do it for us. So I think that there's, there's work that we can do. It's just, it's very different for us to think about. Uh, we've kind of, a lot of us have forgotten, uh, a lot of us, a lot of our libraries have really forgotten that like creating of a, of a collection because it's, it's managed in, in very different ways um, than it used to. So I think that that's um, a skill set that we, we should be bringing back into some of our, of our spaces. Um, so that was the first part of, of the talk that I wanted to do. And the other part is, is really focusing on the infrastructure. And um, this, is, this is one of these ones where it's like, oh yeah, I'll talk about it at a high level. Um, and then I just realized how many, how many moving parts there are to, to infrastructure. And um, unfortunately, it's never uh, as simple as, you know, what system do you use? Insert software name. You're you're done, and hopefully I'll try to to communicate some of that, why that is in this. So these are the these are the pieces that I was I have been working on in um, I pretty much this year currently 2021 in either um, things that were modifying things that were adjusting things that were rethinking, um, which doesn't involve what system we're using at all. Um, 
discussion on like what we're what we're doing with unique identification within our digital objects. Those are decisions that get made, need to be made outside of software. How are we handling controlled vocabularies, both locally developed controlled vocabularies, shared uh, vocabularies for things like um, subjects, what happens whenever you want to use a, a controlled vocabulary, but you need to add extra uh, extra uh, terms to that, then do you have a, a like how does that work um, within kind of a, a shared linked data space? Um, how do we deal with place names? How do we deal with people names? Um, environments for editing metadata, quality assurance tools. Um, we've been doing a lot with our feedback system because it's a new opportunity for engagement with users through our digital collections, which sometimes, um, at least in our institution, is just a, a different subset of. of of workers in the library than our traditional kind of ask us reference librarian folks, and um, for better and for better or worse, it's it's just infrastructure we need to have in place. So I, I wanted to, um, in, I'm not going to go through a lot of, of diagrams, but this is just a highlight. That I, I think that there are two two big things that are important about the way we think about infrastructure at UNT. So we have a a public facing system that is called Aubrey which is what we do to present content to the end user. And that's what you see when you go to any of our digital libraries, the portal, the UNT digital library, or the gateway is called Aubrey. And then the other component is called Coda, which is our, um, our digital repository, which, is, uh, which houses the 3 million digital objects, the just shy of a petabyte of data um, we're managing. It looks like 373 million files for those 3 million items. Um, and this is actually an open source tool that we provide access to through our GitHub page. But um, this is where uh, it, it's, a, it's a tool for managing bags of content and then um, giving information about those and tracking them and replicating them. Um, and so I think that those are kind of two distinctions. By, by separating things, we found that there's a lot of, of interest or a lot of value um, overall. Lots of content comes in from the left. Magic happens in the middle. Stuff goes to the preservation or access. But the part that that I, I kind of really wanted to talk about was in the yellow underneath the, the metadata curation, creation and curation components, because um, that's some of the stuff that oftentimes is either just it's you 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 get what you get with whatever systems or you never get to see what other people are doing behind the scenes because you never see behind the system behind the scenes of other systems and so i'll, I'll talk a little bit about that so um the core of our our digital infrastructure is really based around our metadata um, and our metadata profile it's it's not super complicated it's basically the dublin core elements um, we've added uh, a few other elements, about seven of them, to help organize things and to, to, to deal with some very specific things that we have to describe, like dissertations and scholarly output. Um, we locally qualify those so that you can have multiple types of titles, multiple types of dates, multiple types of identifiers. Um, and then we have a standard um, XML serialization of that. And so that's an example of what that looks like on the right side. So it is not super complicated and it's not rocket science, but it is a standard that we use day in, day out. So everyone knows how to read it. Everyone knows how to write it. And to, to, to make that point home, we actually have a, uh, a Python library that we use for reading and writing all of these files. And it's called PyUNTL. Um, and so there is one way to read these and one way to write them. So you don't run into problems with like four different people writing them slightly differently in uninteresting ways. Um, we also have a tool that gets used quite a bit called uh, M to M, which stands for metadata and metadata, which is deals with the, the, the sad situation that we run into where we're trying, we're given spreadsheets of data and we need to move it from a very rectangular view of the world in this spreadsheet into what we don't think of as a rectangular view, which is the metadata side, um, where you know things are endlessly repeatable. You know things can have um, more than just key value pairs, um, and so it's a tool for help automating some of that and providing a standard set of interfaces to that. And so both of those are available if you ever want to look at how we're doing that. Um, controlled vocabularies are managed in a in a standardized way here, and these are. Um, we wanted, uh, we have a, a place for any, anytime you have a controlled list, 
Um, anytime you have a drop down in a web interface in the digital library that has options you can choose from, that comes from a controlled vocabulary that is managed somewhere. And that's all managed through our, our vocabularies app, which is a, another open source tool that we make available. Um, and it not only provides a way to uh, describe um, vocabularies and controlled lists, but then also provides um, different uh, machine readable formats for those so that a developer can grab the JSON version of the list and immediately put it into their software. And then it's always up to date because they're always pulling from, from the list that's live. And so this has been, been really great to be able to, to have consistency in the, the kinds of um, metadata that we're creating. We've also, we also have um, uh, another little app that we use for managing names that are important to UNT. Um, and so like it's called the UNT name app um, and it's another open source tool that we make available. And so this is really just dealing with like, we need to have authority records for people that don't merit or have not merited yet authority records in the name authority file. And um, it's kind of just the lightweight, the lightweight solution to getting names um, organized and then also allows us to um, get some benefit from those. So you end up with a name record that looks like this for a guy like me. Um, and it's so it's not a ton of stuff, but it's enough to disambiguate me from another person. Um, we only are working to describe people that are important to our collections. And so if they, so we're not, a, we're not describing everyone that could exist or even everybody that could author something at UNT. It's just things that actually come into our, our workflows um, would, for, would actually get name authority records. Um, and it's just a, a standard Django um, interface for creating these, these records. Um, you can link, I think the important thing is you can link them to other existing records. So if they do have a name authority file record, you can link that up. If they have a Wikipedia page or a faculty profile, you can link those up. So you can give these same as relationships between our, our names and our unique identifiers and others. Um, and the biggest benefit for us is like, as you're typing in, in um, type aheads, it actually can do real time lookups. And so like, that is the whole reason for us to do this. So names that appear more than once, we can have consistently input um, and then also move down the road of having them linked to the you know, linked data sort of way. Um, another tool that we provide um, and that is available is uh, dealing with the funky, funky dates that we have to deal with in the cultural heritage world. Um, not everything was published on a given day. Sometimes we just know the month. Sometimes we know it is approximately a month. Sometimes we know it was published between an interval, interval that might be a decade. Sometimes we know that it was published before a date, but we don't know when. And so the extended date time format is a way of uh, presenting that kind of information in the machine readable format. And so there's a validation service and a validation toolkit that we provide. Um, and then that's linked into our systems. Um, we also have a, like, there's all of these components can play together, but then you actually have to talk about how they work together. And so that's done through a metadata application profile um, and an XML schema to fully document the XML formats that we have. And so these are available for, like, when we start to say, you know, titles are required, creators are not required, are things repeatable, um, are, are, and where did we get these terms from? And so I think that the, the application profiles are a really important way of kind of um, writing down what is important about how you've put together your metadata system, especially with how metadata systems are often put together from a combination of different um, systems and vocabularies and, um, uh, term lists. Um, to complement that, then there's the need for documentation on actually how you fill out this content. Um, and we have the situation where we, um, most of our, our metadata creators are either student assistants or they're, they're folks that are working outside of our institutions. And so making sure that um, they are easily accessible to those, those users and also in language that makes sense to those users. And so we've had to, to put that upon ourselves. And so these metadata guides talk about, you know, how do you formulate a, a personal name? And they give examples so that people can kind of 
see what they have in front of them and try to find an example that's very similar to that. Um, and these get constantly updated as, as new things come about and we, we run into new kinds of problems or we start working in areas where our assumptions are challenged about how names are formatted or um, how place names are documented. And so um, just constantly uh, keeping that up to date is really important. Um, we've established what is called, uh, what for us is we think of as the minimally viable record within our systems. And so what does it mean to have a complete record versus an incomplete record? And then once we have that, we can actually start making interesting um, interfaces around that and start guiding people into things that are most needing work versus things that are at least usable. And we've defined usable as, as being a min minimally viable record. And that information is available on our website as well. Um, but I think the, the, the part that I, I think is really interesting, and this is stuff that no one will ever see unless you work within our systems, are, is our metadata editing environment. And I, I don't, um, and so this is basically what it looks like. It's a, um, a pretty standard looking interface. Um, we, on the left side of the screen, there are a number of facets, but I think some of the ones that are really interesting that we're trying to start to highlight are things that what the arrows identify as uh, valid dates versus invalid dates. And so those are dates that validate with that extended date time format versus the ones that don't. Um, and the same thing as like records that are complete versus records that are incomplete. And so you can start to already say, if I need to work on something, what's the biggest bang for my buck? Well, I can focus on either um, complete records that have invalid dates or records that are available to the public that have invalid dates or records that are available to the public that somehow are incomplete records. Um, so you can at least pull that in without having to like manually go through all of the records. And so being able to turn some of these concepts into things that machines can calculate a value for and then present that value is really, really useful. So we're presented with a, um, a kind of a, a dashboard page for an object and you're able to you know, view the object, look at its history for the metadata edits that have happened to it, get a timeline for how long it's been in the system and like what's been happening. Um, and then uh, a nice easy uh, view to be able to understand what's going on with the record itself. Um, you can then go in, it's a, it's a standard kind of template um, based system for adding values, subtracting values, everything's really presented in the same way. Um, every element has a link to the help so that you can immediately get access to all that help documentation. There are other sorts of information like that's the lower arrow points to a TC button. Um, uh, converting something from uppercase to title case is actually like one of the most frustrating things to do because you basically just have to retype it. And so the title case button, you hit that and it just automatically converts things to title case. It's magic. Um, <laughs> and uh, you also have uh, very quick access to things like um, inserting special characters that are challenging or, or often used within a, a set that you may not remember how to get to. Um, on the right side of the record, we also have this little, um, what, what I call the sidecar, which uh, provides an overview of the, the fields, the number of instances of that field, and then it has um, green uh, for, um, so the, the, color, the, the, um, the, the colored buttons are the ones that are part of that minimally viable record, and green means you have at least one value. And if it's red, then you're missing a value. And if it's yellow, that means there's some sort of problem, such as um, this little modal that pops up that says some dates are wrong. And then this other one that says some of your controlled vocabularies are wrong. Um, I showed the drop downs for, for, uh, for um, names that are based off of our, our name app. So as you start to type parks and you can see where that value pops up in the list, um, we have tried to integrate things like the control vocabularies from Library of Congress under genre form terms, um, musical forms. Um, there's about a half dozen, uh, the legislative indexing vocabulary um, that we've used for a number of projects. And then we've also got other controlled lists for things like time periods um, for our portal of Texas history that, that are available as modals within the, the system. And then um, we also have uh, uh, kind of modals for identifying place points and specific uh, spots so you can actually geocode um, very easily items. Um, 
so one of the things that we've, and this is the, the last section I'll be able to talk about. Um, I, I tried to pack too much in, but um, so one of the things that we noticed as, as things went um, fully remote this last year and COVID, it was the fact that um, suddenly we had uh, all of our student assistants in the library had to have work to do outside of, you know, working in a physical library. And so we immediately, uh, within a week, we logged in and we created new metadata editing accounts for about 100 new um, metadata editors and tried to work with them to create um, activities that they could do that were meaningful so they could still get paid, but that would also help move forward the projects. And so one of the challenges we had was um, we had to like, be able to account for that work. Um, and so we have, we've always had this um, metadata events. So as you're editing a record, it kind of gives you a, it, it will do a snapshot for how long an editing event takes whenever you hit publish it back and it'll put that into a little database and so we were able to um, go through and so this is the activity for a, a, a specific day um, it gives you an overview of the day we had 3700 records edited on the 7th or the 15th of july um, it gives you kind of a breakdown of, of when how many editors in a given hour um, the number of editing events, the number of records, how much time, average amount of time, and all of that. You can see which users were most active. So if you're trying to account for um, your, your student assistant's time, you can do that. You can go into that student's time records and see what they're what they accomplished on like July 15th. This user has edited 103, um, 100 different records, and has uh, 103 events. You can see when they were working so you can say like oh they said they were working you know nine to three with an hour lunch break and you can see evidence of that within the system so it's really it's it's been really helpful for us to be able to to allow folks that are not used to managing metadata students to actually do that while we were in this COVID situation um, and i am not at all going to be able to talk about the metadata analysis and quality um, other than say, we've got tools for that. We've got three. One is count, which basically gives you um, counts of records that have a certain thing. So show me how many, how many records have a description. Um, most of them have two descriptions. Some have one and then 46,000 don't. We need to work on those 46,000. Um, and you can use that in really interesting ways. Facet is just gives you facets, like what are all the unique values? Um, you can highlight white space in them and help you kind of work with identifying them. Um, we were really big fans of OpenRefine, but couldn't figure out a way to get records out, get it into OpenRefine, fix it and move it back in. So we just took the concepts within OpenRefine and moved it into this infrastructure. So clustering will give you clusters of things that are probably important to put together. Um, you can sort them by different ways. So you can see all the crazy ways that we've tried to um, spell Dmitry Shostakovich over the years. And then that gives you a way to start identifying which ones need to be um, cleaned up and uh, unified. And um, it also gives you things that um, things that probably should be put together and uh, gives you suggestions on which ones might be the right one versus the wrong ones. And then once you click on one of those, it just gives you those records that are the problems. You can um, also play with different kinds of algorithms and you get different slight diff variations of, of the, the terms back. Um, you can look at all of the things that have the, as you move metadata around errors occur and it's just the it is just the reality and so being able to find those errors is really important and that's one of the things we've been trying to, to work with and so these are all of the subjects that have single values single letter values and so you can go find that subject that is g and see like does it actually need to be there or was it just a typo that got somehow converted as a record went through many different transformations over the years um, same things with uh, applying a mask to things instead of direct dates. Um, and once you start doing things like that, you start have to you start having to sample things in different ways because you get tons and tons of values. Um, so anyway, it's it's part of a, a, a metadata eco ecosystem that we're working on. And I, I think that this is really kind of an important piece of that infrastructure that, is often so far behind because most people are really worried about like what does it look like to the end user but i think the just as the technical services mark the infrastructure we have around the bibliographic metadata is so important 
I think that is equally important in the digital library space, but often is, is overlooked and kind of not talked about, um, partly because it's not as interesting to some, but then also it's often behind, behind the system and nobody ever sees it. And so nobody talks about it. So that's partly why I wanted to talk about this today. Um, so in closing, before some time for questions is um, what we've been trying to do at UNT is build a single infrastructure that we can use for kind of any new digital collection that comes in. And um, for us, it's really easy when a faculty member comes to us and say, I have these digital items. Do you have a place I can put them? It's like, yes, we can create you a collection. Um, and here are the, the basic services that it provides. And here are some examples of your colleagues collections and you can go talk with them. And, and that's been really successful in not only um, helping the faculty, but then also building collections and uh, building resources that the library can then manage in a cost effective way over time, which is I think it was really, really important. Um, we've tried to move the, the conversations so that people are focusing on what they want to do as opposed to how they want to do it. And so like in our special collections area, they can just focus on what makes the most sense for them to spend funding on, to digitize, to collect, to preserve. And they don't worry about how they're going to do it all the time because that has a set of like, we know how that's gonna happen. It's got an, we've got infrastructure in place. We've got workflows for managing content as it comes through whether or not it's from a vendor, whether or not it's in-house scanning or born digital content. So they're, 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 they're able to think about what it, like building the collections and the description of the collections and not just the, the, the fiddly parts of like how it gets structured, how it gets put online, which metadata formats are gonna get used, um, how is it gonna display to the users? Like all of that is taken care of because it's a single infrastructure for all of that. Um, infrastructure is forgotten about as long as it works is a, a really important thing. And that I think comes into to play. We, we had a situation in Texas a couple of uh, last month where our entire infrastructure went down for a week because of the ice storms. And um, it was it was amazing how many people understood, but then also like it doesn't like why wasn't this done differently? Um, and the, as, as things, when they do break and you start to have, you know, 50 people in a library working in that system every day, you kind of move from a, eh, it's not a big deal to like, no, this is actually like, there are 50 people whose jobs rely on being able to use these systems all day long. And so that kind of gets you in a different mindset as a maintainer. And I think that's really important for for everyone to think about but yeah infrastructure infrastructure is great and you want to you want to get it to a point where it can be forgotten about but it only gets forgotten about as long as it works and i think um you know recent events in texas are very clear for that um, and with that i think um i am finished with the prepared talk and tried to get it in at 50 minutes so um had to skip a few things i tried to pack too many things in there but we can open it up to questions and um Again, here's my contact information. If anyone wants to contact me afterwards, always happy to, to chat. Yeah, so thanks so much, Mark. Um, everybody, let's thank Mark for a really thought-provoking talk on what it means to steward digital cultural heritage collections today. I think we heard about some really interesting approaches to dealing with challenges like obsolete formats, like microcards I had totally forgotten about. Um, and in, incomplete and imprecise data, um, and the things they're doing to make these documents and data accessible to users of cultural heritage material. Um, so we'll now move into the Q&A portion um, of the talk. Just a reminder that you can put your questions into chat, and Cindy Edgar will be moderating them for Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, we did have just uh, more of a comment. Uh, first from Gary, uh, says that if you're still looking for a solution for digitizing your microcards, he may have a solution. Um, he received an IML, IMLS grant um, and he'd be happy to chat further with you um, regarding solutions to that, so. Yeah, I think that'd be great. We're, we're currently like three quarters of the way through that project with a vendor here in the Dallas Fort Worth area who had to build a scanner for doing those specific cards. But yeah, it'd be great to connect and kind of share information. I had not, um, in researching this, I had not found 
anyone documented that was doing kind of similar large scale projects. So it'd be good to have a chat about that. Great. Um, we have a question from Eric. He asks, uh, or he says, I'm wondering if you could share your approach to getting support from the library and campus for building and maintaining such an impressive digital library and metadata infrastructure and tools. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, there's, there is no way that we could have done this without um, very supportive uh, in very supportive administration going forward. And so I um, luckily had a like an amazing, amazing administrator that I worked for for almost all my career, um, Kathy Hartman, who actually I think is in the audience. Um, but she she was the one that constantly fought for infrastructure. And she's also the one that kind of put this idea in motion. And I think that what we were seeing is that there was just such a waste early on and every project would get funded and every project would do something different in uninteresting ways. They put it up differently in uninteresting ways. And we were left with all of this just mess. And so everyone like that, you couldn't integrate anything. We had no idea who was doing what. And so um, the vision was to, to unify all of that um, into a single platform that we could actually move forward. Um, and I think the, the, the vehicle that we were able to use was the Portal Texas History to, to develop those ideas around that platform. Um, and then, then it's built out from then. But, um, but yeah, I, I view the trying to get library support. Um, we, it, it's clear that UNT, because of the, the kind of institution we are, you know, we are a research institution, a research library, we're a fairly large university. But we've been a research library of, you know, I you can't see my finger quotes here, a research library for only like 30 or 40 years. And so comparing us to like libraries that have been collecting aggressively for over a hundred years, it's impossible to think. So one of the things that we identified early in the um, 2000s, like uh, an area that we could really contribute is the digital side and become known for. And I think that the, um, the uh, administration saw that and then that from that we have a, a, a division that does digital library infrastructure and digitization and we've tried to maintain that and that is part of my role as the associate dean is to kind of bully my administration into supporting it which i don't have to do that often because they've seen investment the other piece on that is that it is impossible to implement all of this overnight, um, like all of the things that we talk about, which I think is really interesting infrastructure, we've been putting, we, we've had one system for the past 12 years. And so we've been able to incrementally build on that platform and that concepts and those concepts around how we do metadata and how we think about packaging digital objects and how we think about presenting content to the users. We've been able to iterate on those. And um, I think that's an important approach. There are very few um, oftentimes when you lo look at infrastructure that it's there's there's a desire to kind of shift to the new shiny um, way of doing something, but trying to say like, how can we develop something that will be here for 10 years so that we can actually iterate on it um, has been a, something that, that we tried to do this last time in, the, in 2010 and we're still in that same system, same infrastructure, same concepts and able to, to just iterate on that. So um, we're in some areas, it's pretty slow moving, but we we're able to innovate in areas that I think people notice, but still just have a really stable way of packaging content, describing content and making it available. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we are out of time. Um, Sophia, do you wanna? Yeah, so um, let's all thank Mark again for a really interesting talk. Um, for those of you who are gonna be joining us in the next hour, I know we didn't get to all the questions, um, but please feel free to bring those over into the next session where we'll be talking with Mark a little further. Thanks everybody. Thank you.